Mobile network operator is the term usually used to refer to a facilities-based carrier, that is, a company that owns base stations, a mobile switch, backhaul between them, and spectrum licenses, and sells services to the public and to other carriers. It should be noted that in many parts of the world, the facilities-based carrier does not own the towers. It turns out that it's more efficient for a separate tower company to own the towers and rent out spaces to mobile network operators. The mobile network operator implements external links to other carriers for PSTN phone calls and for internet traffic. For PSTN phone calls, the mobile network operator implements a fiber optic connection to a building traditionally called a toll center or class 4 switching office. Historically there was one per major city. The termination of their fiber in that building is called a POP. It's their point of presence in the building. Many other carriers have POPs in the building including the incumbent local exchange carrier, the ILEC, in other words, the local phone company, inter-exchange carriers, in other words, long-distance providers, community antenna television companies, or cable TV companies, other mobile carriers, and any other company that wants to connect phone calls to a phone on the mobile network operator's network like, for example, Skype minutes being used to make a phone call from Skype to a cell phone. The operator of the toll center, which is usually the ILEC, provides a switch in the toll center to switch phone calls from one carrier's POP to a different carrier's POP. For internet access, the mobile network operator implements a fiber optic connection to one or more internet exchange buildings, where they pay the operator of the internet exchange to route packets to other carriers with whom the mobile network operator has established IP packet transmit and peering arrangements. The mobile virtual network operator is the term used to refer to a non-facilities-based carrier, one that does not own the hardware or spectrum licenses or POPs. Instead, the MVNO enters into a long-term contract with one or more facilities-based carriers to have them supply a white label service that the MVNO sells. Typically, the mobile virtual network operator will develop a unique branding and sell smartphones and tablets to go along with its service. When the MVNO deals exclusively with one carrier, the virtual network operator's bill to the customer would typically be generated by the facilities-based carrier as a white label service. If the MVNO is very large, and deals with multiple carriers, the MVNO may operate their own billing system, which is a significant investment. We're talking a hundred million dollars for a full billing system for a mobile network operator. The facilities-based carrier bill to the virtual operator includes a volume discount rate for IP addresses and internet traffic, voice minute airtime, and switched access to the POP for PSTN phone calls. The MVNO also has to pay for connectivity from the POP to other toll centers for long distance connections and the switched access charge at the far end. The rate plan that the virtual network operator pays to the facilities-based carrier could be a mix of fixed rate leases and usage-based billing. Unless the facilities-based carrier, the mobile network operator, is obliged to sell capacity to mobile virtual network operators through regulations and tariffs, the nature of the plan between the mobile network operator and mobile virtual network operator is confidential business information.
Roaming service is very similar to the service provided to virtual network operators in that it's the mobile network operator that's providing the air link, the base stations, the backhaul, the mobile switch, and connections to the public telephone network and the internet. Except that in the case of roaming, the visitor's phone has been activated on a different carrier's network. And this means that the visitor does not have a billing agreement directly with the carrier that they're trying to connect to. The roamer's carrier must have a roaming agreement in place with the carrier that the roamer is connecting to before any roaming is going to happen. When a roamer requests service, they'll transmit the International Mobile Subscriber Identity, that's the user ID, to the carrier. The first digits of the IMSI identify the country and then the carrier. This is used to query the roamer's carrier whether they agree to pay the charges for the subscriber's roaming. The International Mobile Subscriber Identity is also used to retrieve information about the roamer from the roamer's carrier's switch. This is stored in a visitor location register in the roaming carrier switch. Once enabled and registered on the network, the visitor and their communications are treated the same as those of the home customers. The difference is where the bill for the roamer's usage goes. The determinations that the billing system makes from call records obtained from the switch to direct the charges to an individual customer's bill or to a carrier's bill. The billing between the two carriers could be any combination of per minute or per byte volume discounts or fixed rate plans. In most cases the carriers have customers roaming on each other's networks. Traditionally, the carriers would compare totals each month, and the carrier with the lower traffic would pay the other carrier a settlement for the difference. In some cases, the carriers may have historically had generally equal traffic on each other's networks. And so to save significant administrative costs, they come to an agreement to have no settlements between them. In other words, reciprocal free roaming of their customers on each other's networks. The roamer, of course, pays for all of this in the end. The roamer's carrier bills the roamer flat rate monthly, flat rate daily, for a plan with a reasonable charge for voice minutes and mobile internet, or the occasional use rate. In other words, the no plan astronomically high rate. Roaming is an important feature for smaller players. Typically, they would be facilities based in selected cities, but to offer a national and international service to their customers, they must have roaming agreements in place with mobile network operators in other locations. By denying roaming service to smaller or startup carriers, or charging an exorbitant price for roaming, an incumbent carrier can erect a barrier against competition. In many countries, the right to roam and the wholesale cost of roaming is regulated to encourage competition.